It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My next guest this week, Werner Herzog, you know, the legendary German film director. What's he been up to lately? Well, he's 74 now. It's not like that's mattered any. In the last two years, he has released two scripted features, two more documentaries, and he has plenty of other stuff coming up. His latest film is called Salt and Fire. It's a thriller set in Bolivia's surreal Uyuni Salt Flats. It stars Veronica Ferris, a very famous German actress. She plays a German scientist sent to Bolivia to do some geological research. But Ferris and her colleague are kidnapped early on by a businessman played by Michael Shannon. It's at times a bizarre, almost encantory movie shot in a really compelling hypnotic way. In this scene, Michael Shannon, the kidnapper, has just removed her blindfold. I demand to be set free now. Now. Please drink. No, thank you. It may taste strange, even bitter, but it will help you adapt to the altitude. I do not care. The tea is brewed from cocoa leaves. That is it. I want my handcuffs removed. You have scratched one of my men and bitten another. I am proud of that. Well, that is why you are wearing handcuffs. Can I take them off now? Look at me. Look at me. Can I take them off now? Yes, you can. Werner Herzog, thank you so much for talking to me. It's great to see you again. Thank you. Um, when you wrote this film, which you did, uh, adapted from a short story, was your intent to create naturalistic dialogue? No, not really, because uh, the dialogues are very, very stylized. Here in the th little clip that we have, that's very much at the beginning of the film, a hostage taking, very mysterious. Um, yes, it uh, appears to be some some sort of uh, almost like a thriller, but it morphs into something completely unexpected, different, uh, very stylized dialogues about, uh, for example, um, anamorphic art, right. uh, where all of a sudden a painting of a saint under a tree done in the 1640s or so, when you approach it, it doesn't look like a saint anymore. It stretches out into a, a 30 feet wide landscape. Right, that it's painted along a long corridor, a corridor along the wall yes, of a long yeah. corridor. So yes. when you look at it from a certain angle, it looks like a painting of the saint. But when you look at it from a 90 degree angle straight on, it's a landscape. Yes. Having and, to do with the saint's life. Right. Um, why did you make that choice? Um, I think these uh, things about uh, uh, perspectives and truth and what constitutes uh, a vision of things has, has been long dormant in me. And I always thought it should be part of a, of a feature film. And of course, uh, things are unexpected. All of a sudden, the lady whom we have heard in the clip who is a scientist is deliberately stranded in the middle of gigantic salt flats. Um, actually in Bolivia, uh, together with two blind boys, local boys who speak only Spanish and Quechua, the local native Indian language, and she has to survive with them. And only at the end we understand why uh, she was uh, exposed and stranded uh, in the middle of these gigantic salt flats. Why not just make a, an exciting thriller? Because you could just make an exciting thriller about somebody getting kidnapped for to make a point about an environment an impending environmental disaster um it could have been but i think it would have been a shallow film and uh, of course when you look environmental disaster it's very fictitious uh, this uh, diablo blanco quote unquote disaster doesn't exist salt flats uh, they are there since millions of years in bolivia and um not man-made, but speculating um, the, as if that was man-made and would spread out, and it spreads out uh, mile after mile each year, and it could spread across the entire continent, maybe even our entire planet. That's a, uh, that's a very strange thought, and of course there's an element of science fiction in it. Lots of discourse about aliens. Now when you shoot in salt flats in Bolivia that are too big to walk out of, part of what you're signing up to do is live there, be there. 
Um, how does it change? How is your movie different that you are doing them in this real place than it would be if, you know, you had the technology to seamlessly superimpose that grand vista behind your actor? Um, not really. When they move in it and uh, long traveling shots and so quite a few things you cannot do with uh, digital effects but if you but i get the feeling that even if you could do them with digital effects that you would be inclined to go there and be in the place right yeah because the feeling of space itself uh, and the focus on on human beings all of a sudden uh, it becomes intensified and it's good for the actors it's good for uh, um, for the images you have never seen locations like that it's it looks like somewhere in outer space. There's something futuristic, science fiction about it, and, and I really like it. Yeah, I mean, there's something remarkable about the tension between the intense practicality that you have to have to make a feature film, and especially when you're doing it on a budget without much room, and the intense impracticality of taking an airplane and a train and a drive three hours out into the middle of a salt flat to set up a camp with a famous German actress. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like those two things seem like they would be in opposition, but in fact, they they kind of work together in harmony in a weird way. It, it does, um, but that's a mystery of cinema. And taking a German actress out in, in such an environment, there's nothing special about it. Tourists go there. They're in throngs, but at a different season, and there's nothing wrong about it. The problem with Veronica Ferris, a star in the film, a great German actress, was that her father passed away only a few days before we started shooting. So I said to her, there's more important, uh, there are things more important than making a movie. You have to bury your father first. Do that first. We'll wait. It doesn't matter. And so, of course, uh, it reduced our days of shooting even more. And secondly, she came in a way that she was very vulnerable. And she would cry at the shoulder of my wife. And and you just interrupt shooting and uh, an hour later, or half an hour later, she would come back and she would say, I am done crying, uh, let's move on. And this is really brave. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I'm talking with Werner Herzog. He just released his newest movie. It's a thriller called Salt and Fire. How do you make a movie with actors as various as the actors that are in this film? In addition to a German star, uh, you have Gael Garcia Bernal, who's um, yeah. know, a, a totally magnetic yeah. Mexican actor who now I think lives in the United States. I might be wrong. Um, you have uh, Michael Shannon, a great American actor. You have a, do you have a non-actor? You have a theoretical physicist in a significant yeah, role. A cosmologist, Lawrence <laughs> Krauss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you have you have uh, two Bolivian children, <laughs> blind boys yeah. in the film. Yeah. So how do you um, how do you make a tone between people that are that different? You have to have it in you as a director. Uh, casting is such an important part, and you just don't um, combine a German star and uh, a great actor like Michael Shannon together. You just don't toss them together. Um, you have to know before you even start thinking that this will be great texture among them. And you see it with Gael, uh, the Mexican, and Lawrence Krauss, a cosmologist who is a natural actor, in my opinion, and I know him since years, and we became friends. And I said to him, you look like a villain. You should play a villain. And he was immediately ready to do that. But um, it was immediately clear uh, it's uh, chemistry. How do you get that is mysterious, but uh, you have to know it's going to function. Are you afraid to travel anywhere? No, not really. I mean, why should I? Well, I mean, you could, uh, you're old enough that you could fall and break a hip and it would be a long way to the hospital or something like that. I'm, I mean, not I, that young people can't fall and I'm break a hip. I'm not fe as feeble as that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still, I just came back from uh, 
uh, trekking in the mountains of northwestern uh, Spain with my younger son. So I, I love to do these things once in a while. But um, now there's uh, people think, oh, we are going to the jungle in the Amazon. Uh, it's so dangerous. No, it is not. It's just another forest. Or going, well, I wouldn't go uh, shooting a film in the eastern Congo because it's a war zone. You just don't go there and, and be stupid enough and, and shoot a film. But recently I've been in North Korea, filming in North Korea, and, and I'd like to go back. But I, I don't mind, and you just do the right things. It's interesting that your that your concern for prudence is so significant when such a big part of your art is staring into the awesome, the awe-inspiring whether it's natural or not, like things that seem too big to comprehend or too significant, powerful to comprehend is so central to what you do. Sure. And you can see it very clearly in my film on volcanoes into the inferno. Um, there is a certain risk because they are sometimes unpredictable. You might have an explosion and it actually happened while we were shooting. There was an explosion. Um, and we were only something like two and a half miles away from the crater. And after 60 seconds or so of shooting, we fled. And only a week or so later, the same volcano really exploded big. And exactly where we had our camera, uh, seven or eight peasants perished. Sometimes you have to be a little bit lucky and you have to be prudent. Remind me again why you're not scared to go to these places. <laughs> well, how can I say it? I, I'm not afraid of anything. Why should I be afraid? Are you afraid of death? No, that's probably the key of it. How how do you handle the, your own mortality? And it's, it's quite insignificant if you die. Who cares? And uh, the universe itself couldn't even care less. So we, we are just such a tiny, tiny speck somewhere in the universe. And um, there's a monumental indifference out there, whether we are alive or not. So that makes I've me settled feel, in with that. That makes me feel worse about it, Werner. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, uh, we, we don't have to make such a big fuss about uh, our own mortality. We all eventually die. And that's that. Well, so you better, you better live well and uh, live a, a meaningful life. I, I was I was laughing with you before the show about how you have two films coming out, two two narrative feature films coming out at the same time in the United On States. On the same day. On the same day. Let's face it. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's uh, really weird. And yeah. you have uh, other documentary films that are close enough for them to be your new film. Right. Uh, is part of what you feel like constitutes a well-lived life for you personally, that kind of productivity, the idea that you are making something, that you are not getting bogged down and not making something? I've never kept uh, abreast with all this onslaught, the vehemence of, of things coming at me. But at the same time, uh, it may sound as if I were a workaholic. I'm not. I... I'm totally relaxed. I work steadily. Well, I mean, the last time I saw you, I was interviewing your son for my show. That was my the house. other one. That, I right. just the doorbell rang, and I walked down my my long front steps in the house I used to yeah. live in, and uh, down at the bottom of the stairs. Well, there's two Herzogs. Yeah, <laughs> and I thought, well, somebody's taking a minute off from their busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> to come to my house for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Must now, love his children. <laughs> I, I, it's strange because I, I'm not hectic or I'm not a workaholic or anything. And you see, I can work in a very focused way. I write for uh, Salt and Fire. I wrote the screenplay maybe in five, maybe six days. But I, at the same time, I, I would... Uh, uh, fill in my tax uh, returns or answer the phone once in a while and I would write, let's say, 10 pages and then go to the bank because I had to go to the bank because I see the entire film in front of my eyes. Is that also true when you're making nonfiction films? To what extent do you see a nonfiction film? Um, 
quite often I, I stage things, I script things. So the distinction between a documentary or non-fiction and fiction is not as clear as for many other people. But of course, when you are doing a film like um, Into the Inferno or whatever else, you cannot completely predict what's coming at you, but you have to be prepared. When you're making a documentary that's about people, um, you know, many of your documentaries are substantially about the natural world and you can go and point a camera at them and we hear you talk. Um, but when you're making a documentary about people, are you always comfortable with the part of that that is basically bothering them? That you are imposing yourself upon their lives, that you're asking things of them. Sure, I do. Um, and that's filmmaking. You see, I've heard it once in a while that documentary filmmakers should be just like the fly on the wall. Wrong. We are filmmakers. We are creators. It's a wrong perspective. If you have uh, a security camera in a bank and you wait for 15 years and not a single robber is even arriving. And even if a bank robbery occurs from a, from a little camera on the wall, it would look totally boring. So we are creating. I, I was on an airplane six or nine months ago and I watched a little detour needs to fly. Your film from, I guess it's sort of the, the mid 1990s. Yes. And, um, it's a really remarkable film about a German-American airman who was uh, in the U.S. Air Force and was a prisoner of war in Laos. He survived an, ex an unfathomable prisoner of war experience. Yeah. Yeah, an ordeal of unspeakable proportions. Yeah, I mean, genuinely. See, John, John McCain, uh, who is considered the real hero, uh, didn't go through right. half of what... Dieter Dengler went. So part of the film is is interviews with him in the United States, reminiscing mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Part of the film is the two of you traveling through Laos, experiencing and visiting and in some cases reenacting the things that he went through. Yeah. There's a scene that I found very affecting where he is narrating a portion of his captivity where he was mar forcibly marched through the jungle. Yes. And as we do this, there are Lao guys there, or I presume Lao guys there. It was actually Thailand right at the border with Laos on, on Mekong River. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. And and he is bound and jogging through through the forest as the, you know, however old he was, 50 year old man in the film. And I, I, we have a clip from it, so I, I want to yeah. listen to it. And for me, 30 years later, when I was a pilot in Vietnam, I was a prisoner. I was tortured and they wanted me to sign a piece of paper saying that I condemned the American action in Vietnam. And I was strong enough not to, not to do that. Many times these strengths came through my grandfather. I was thinking of him and he, if he could do it, so could I do it. Uh oh, this feels a little bit too close to home. Bye, bye. Of course, Dieter knew it was only a film. But all the old terror returned as if it were real. I thought, you guys behind me with your camera can only see my back, but you can't know how my heart is thumping inside. I told myself, okay, play along with them. Running like this might chase the demons away. Do you feel guilty about putting someone through that? No, of course not. Uh, Dieter says something very significant. Uh, go along with it, it might chase the demons away, which uh, it was healthy for him to to be tied up and, and running through the jungle with his ca uh, captors. Um, you have to know with whom you are dealing and you have to see uh, what kind of uh, inner stability they have. And with uh, Dieter Dengler, you could do this. I wouldn't do it with uh, someone else, for example. But in this case, yes, totally legitimate. And that's uh, how you really dig very, very deep into the heart of, of someone who is on, on uh, your screen. Okay, two questions uh, that were suggested to me that I, I found really interesting and wanted to ask you. The first was, do you watch any sitcoms? No, I, I barely know what it is. 
<laughs> but I think it's people sitting on couches and talking. Yeah, Sometimes well, when I zap through channels, I, I see people talking uh, in their kitchen or in their living room. Now, I, I really know very little about it. What's your favorite, like, unimportant thing to do? That's a much deeper question. <laughs> <laughs> I like to watch but, baseball, yeah. Werner. When, what I like about baseball is I have a very sophisticated understanding of it, and there is a sophisticated understanding of it to be had. Yeah. But it is also a little bit boring, and it does not matter at all. Um, I do understand that part. Uh, for me, it would be watching soccer because I played it myself uh, fifth division or so. I mean, at a fairly low level. And I like to watch games where I see players that can read the game. And that's something very unique, very special. Very few players in the world have this ability to read uh, spatial movements and read what's coming at them. Uh, the other question is, what happened the time that you got shot on camera? I've watched it, and I'm still not sure what happened. Well, because you haven't uh, seen or heard the preceding <laughs> 10 or true. 15 minutes uh, when they set up, it was a BBC interview, when they set up a camera that was from across the street, somebody raving and ranting, a little bit like road rage. Always these movie stars and the cameras and F you and get out of here and so. And uh, we started the conversation on camera and all of a sudden I heard some sort of an explosion on the tape. You, it's, it's like a minor sort of shot, but it sounded like an explosion. And I thought the camera had exploded because something glowing hot like a like a three pound glowing hot piece of metal hit me in the in the area of my belt and i looked at the camera and i see it was hadn't exploded and i said what was that and i see a man ducking at the veranda on the other side of the street and I wanted to at least finish my sentence and, and finish the thought. I, I knew I was hit. And and then I, I we, we looked at the situation and I, I saw that um, the bullet, minor sort of bullet, uh, had perforated my leather jacket and the catalog in the pocket and shirt and underwear and everything. But it hadn't penetrated into my intestines. So I was bleeding, but uh, it was superficial. And I said, uh, this was an insignificant bullet, which made its round in the internet. <laughs> that was a pretty it, great thing to say. <laughs> no, it, it was insignificant. So right. I said the right thing. I, I made a correct assessment of the well, situation. Well, I think the part that's amazing about it is that you made a correct assessment of the situation. Sure. That yes. in and of itself is yeah. remarkable. Well, and it's not the first time I've been shot at. Uh, I've been shot at much more dangerously with much bigger guns. And uh, you can never get acquainted to it. But I think once... Uh, Winston Churchill, the young Winston Churchill, once famously said uh, it's one of the most exhilarating moments in a man's life to be shot at unsuccessfully. <laughs> well, Werner, I've taken so much of your time and I'm so grateful uh, to get to see you again and talk to you again. Thank you again. Thank you as well. Thank you.